HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. Okay, it's Thursday at one o'clock, and you are turned in, turned into, turned into, turned on to the Farm Report on the Heritage Radio Network. Want to take a quick moment to thank today's sponsor, the Museum of Food and Drink. They'd like to extend an invitation to all of the radio listeners to their Get the Ball Rolling fundraiser Sunday, March twenty seventh, one p.m. at Del Posto. You can join Dave Arnold of the French Culinary Institute and Patrick Martins of Heritage Foods USA, in addition to a bevy of New York's finest chefs and drink shakers, you know, impression makers. Uh, If you want to learn more, check out www.mofad.org or email info at mofad.org. I would love to see you there. All right. Our show today, I'm excited. We're on the line with Janet Britt. So Janet is the easement steward for the Agricultural Stewardship Association up in Washington County. But um, Janet, can you tell us a little bit? ASA um, serves more than just wa- it's Washington, Rensselaer, and Columbia. Is that right? No, just Washington and Rensselaer counties okay. at this point. Um, it, it started out just Washington County in the last five years. We've started working um, at the request of some of the people in Rensselaer County with some of the bigger farm projects there. Okay. Can you tell us um, two things? What kind of ASA does and then what an easement steward is? Sure. Um, I, I think people often wonder when I list it as my job what the heck it is. But um, ASA um, is a nonprofit uh, land trust working with um, farmers and the community in our two rural counties up here to protect farmland, and we also put easements on forest land. Um, And an easement basically is a legal deed that goes with the property, which spells out um, certain restrictions on the type of development that can take place on the property. So in our case, we are... Um, trying to conserve the agricultural lands and um, and try to um, limit the amount of construction houses or um, subdivision that happens with those lands. Okay, and then as as the easement steward, what does your role look like on a day to day basis? Well, my job, uh, one of the primary things I do when we have a new project that we're working with, a farm that we're placing an easement on. Um, I go out and I walk the property, try to uh, look all around um, pretty thoroughly, talk with the landowner, um, and I write a written description of the property, and I take photographs and create maps, and we create what's called a baseline document. And it basically just sets the gives you a picture of what the property was like when the easement was made and documents the conservation values that are being protected. And it serves as a record for um, these easements are in perpetuity. So if there's any question or issue down the line of what conditions were like um, at the beginning, you can refer to this baseline. Um, And then the second major thing that I do is um, we have the responsibility once an easement is made to 
try to ensure that the terms of the easements are being upheld. So we walk these properties at least once a year. So um, I guess I have one of the nicest jobs here because I get to go out and walk these beautiful farms and forests um, once a year. We usually start in April or whenever the snow melts, which who knows when that will be this year. Um, and we um, work through till uh, hunting season in the fall. Yeah, not the best time to be doing a forestry right. walk <laughs> in the middle of hunting season, dodging bullets. Right. Um, Awesome. So if people want to learn a little bit more about the work of ASA, where can they find out about your organization? Well, probably the, the easiest way is we have a website, which is www.agstewardship.org. And that gives an idea of the projects we're working on, some of the programs that we're currently doing, um, and has links to other related um, organizations. Awesome. Great. And well, we, we love members from all over the, the state and the country. I myself am a member. Yeah. Um, so um, very fascinating work through ASA, ASA, but what we brought you on the show to talk about today is a little bit more um, of your personal history with farming. And mm -hmm. I know that for, for quite some time you made your living running a, a CSA um, can you tell us a little bit um, kind of broadly about that, and then maybe we'll take kind of a step back in time and, and talk about how you got there. Sure. Um, in um, the late 80s, I had been living um, in the Midwest and moved back to New York State to be a little closer to my family. And um, the idea of community-supported agriculture had just kind of taken root in Mass western Massachusetts um, on the Indian line farm. And a group of people in the Albany area wanted to start a CSA farm in, in the Capital District area. So I was looking for a farm, and they were looking for a farmer. So we um, joined up and actually spent a year planning. Um, it was a very much a grassroots endeavor with um, people trusting that uh, I knew what I was doing and um, me trusting that we'd find the number of people that we needed to make it work. But people um, volunteered um, their land. Um, the two people who were involved at the beginning had a farm. They were not farmers, so we started farming there. We started out with about um, 80 shareholders or families the first year, and then we grew over the years to about 100 families that we grew vegetables for each year. And that farm ran for um, 17 years and um, was a really great experience for me, and I think for for the members, too. People tended to, to um, sign up year after year, and, you know, I got to see kids grow up, and um, uh, people got to see, you know, perennials that we had planted on the farm grow and mature, so it was a great experience. That's, that's awesome. So kind of taking a, a step back in time, you're, let's say, you know, graduating high school, you're from mm -hmm. the area. Did you grow up on a farm? Did you know, always know you wanted to be a farmer? Kind of how did you get from, from there, there to, to running the, the CSA in the Albany area? Yeah, it was, uh, it was kind of a, not a plan on my part. I grew up in the country, but um, by the time I was born, my father did not have a, well, he had a farm, but he only farmed it part-time and grew crops like snap beans and dry beans and hay. Um, but I always liked being outside, um, and so I went to Cornell, and I was studying plant science, probably aiming to go into a, you know, a research-type career. Um, and then um, my college boyfriend had studied horticulture with a man named Alex Alan Chadwick, who was a British horticulturist who had come to UC Santa Cruz in the late 60s and really, um, I think, was responsible for making popular the whole raised bed gardening um, interest in this country. Um, and he took on interns. Um, and so when I graduated from college, I um, went and did an apprenticeship with him 
and basically fell in love with gardening. And um, that was the start of many steps that eventually led me to (laughs) starting the CSA farm. So the apprenticeship was in California? At that point, it was the last place that he actually worked. He was in poor health. Um, It was in Virginia. Okay. Um, And um, from there, I kind of hopscotched around. I worked on a couple of farms in California and then worked for three years on a farm in Missouri before returning um, back to New York. Um, And he had taught... Um, you know, so many people over the years that there was kind of this community of of old Chadwickian interns who um, across who were farming and gardening across the country. So um, it was you could find people if you wanted to get some experience, you know, farming, and that's what I did. So they had kind of created this informal network of you know right. you know someone who knows someone who has a place and they might take you exactly. So. So I know, um, I don't know a ton about the kind of existence of those type of informal networks Mm -hmm. today. I mean, I'm familiar with like the the woofing where, you know, young people can go and spend, you know, a variety of time kind of farm hopping. Right. But but was was that like this process for you um, at the time you were like wanting to learn more, just kind of caught up in in the lifestyle, I mean, did you see yourself at this point as really kind of building a foundation that would serve kind of as your, your future career or were you just kind of like hanging out? Um, I would say I knew it was the work that I love to do, but I also approached it as a lifestyle and um, was kind of of the mindset that you wouldn't want to sully the beauty of it all by examining the finances of it too closely. <laughs> so um, I was just basically gardening and loving it and, and, not, and knowing that I wanted to do that, but not thinking too much about how I would actually earn more of a living from it. Um, and so eventually, though, when the CSA model actually kind of helped do that because it gave you a kind of a structure or a way of approaching it so that you could um, fashion it to to try to have it be more um, financially viable for the long term. And was, I mean, the C- CSA has become a term that, you know, our listeners are definitely familiar with. There's, mm-hmm. there's a pretty good um, community, even in New York City, of um, CSA members right. who pick mm-hmm. up at the markets here or, or run their own CSA programs with, you know, farmers that they partner with in the right. greater New York area. Um, kind of at the time when you were starting to farm, CSA was, was kind of a new, a new model. I mean, where did, that, where did that idea come from? Were there people, were there specific people who kind of launched that, or how did you learn about it? Yes. Um, there was a woman who lived in uh, western Massachusetts. Her name was Robin Van N, and she owned a small farm there. And um, some people had brought back this idea um, which we now call CSA, which was popular in Japan for several years, where people in urban Japanese cities would make that connection with farmers and be, you know, distributing foods with food within their neighborhood. So Robin was totally inspired by this idea, and she basically dedicated um, the rest of her life to popularizing it. She traveled all over. She really, I think, was um, responsible for getting CSAs, um, getting the idea out there. And she, um, along with um, uh, her name escapes me right now, they wrote a handbook on how to to organize and um, different ideas for running CSAs. And that really helped different farmers and organizations really take it to another level. So really something that's pretty widespread across the country right now, you know, was really just getting started in the late 80s. Um, and um, Robin, unfortunately, died too young. She, um, she died in 1996, I think it was. But um, she really, really got the ball rolling, and I was I met her through a through a college friend, and that's how I got interested in it. Wow! So you were really kind of 
at the ground level, like right when this this movement started sweeping. Yes, yes as a matter of fact, um, when we started our CSA, um, another a community member who helped start it, we went to NOFA New York, which is the Organic Farming Association, and we we gave a, a workshop on it. Um, you know, it was this totally new idea that we were kind of helping spread the word about. Amazing. And it really took off. Radical young farmers. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I want to hear a little bit more about putting your farm together. We're going to take a quick break, and when we get back, we'll delve into that. Great. service announcement from Heritage Radio Network. Tune in to the main course Sundays at 12 p.m. with hosts Patrick Martins and Katie Kiefer. They examine issues from the interconnected worlds of agriculture, cuisine, and sustainability. They sit down with key players in the chain from producer to consumer, farmers, distributors, chefs, activists, and journalists. The main course explores every important component of the eating experience, how the farmers raise their product, the distribution channels that move the product, how the chefs prepare it, and how ethics and policy affect everyone involved. Again, that's the main course, Sundays at noon, on the Heritage Radio Network. Okay, welcome back. You are tuned in to the Heritage Radio Network. You're listening to The Farm Report. We are on the line with Janet Britt. She is an easement steward for the Agricultural Stewardship Association, but today we have her talking about her her experience farming and being really at the the forefront of the CSA movement. And Janet, I think that you know, for a lot of young farmers who kind of come onto our show and, and are a lot, lot of young people who are you know interested in getting into farming, the kind of model that you you talked about, where you essentially move from farm to farm, apprenticing yourself, apprenticing yourself, kind of exchanging your like youth and energy for the um for the the information and really the know-how of farming is is a pretty kind of special way to build that base of knowledge and get a chance to you know make mistakes in a safe environment around Mm -hmm. people who know more than you and i but what i think kind of after that you get to this point where yeah you want to have your own farm and start you know having access to land and equipment um in addition to the know-how is a big hurdle so can you talk a little bit more about kind of how that how that worked for you and and kind of what the key players were and and how you know from a financial aspect too and i don't want to shy away from from talking about the money because that's obviously a really important part of being a successful farmer but how did how did it look getting kind of food in the ground at the very beginning Mm -hmm. well um as you described it, that was kind of how I felt. I had been working on several farms and really kind of was ready to test myself to see what I could do. Um, and I was, I would say that many young farmers are probably in a better position today because I think there's more knowledge out there of what it actually takes to get started and there's more resources out there. Um, but when I started, I didn't have um, much capital to work with. Um, we were on a, we rented a farm, we traded, you know, the use of five acres in exchange for a share, um, which was pretty reasonable. The farm, the, the land owners had a tractor that we could use initially. Um, and actually there was a, a farmer in the area who was between farms, and he, um, Steve Gilman is his name, he still does work for NOFA New York. Um, he came and actually worked with me the first season and helped me a lot because he brought some of his equipment, and we were plowing up a hay field, and um, so 
there was quite a lot of work that had to happen the first year just to get the soil ready. I built a small um, kind of a lean-to greenhouse, but it was definitely uh, um, operating on a very slim budget to get started. Um, over the years, as um, you know, we kind of solidified what scale we were working on. We pretty much stayed with um, about 100 families that we were growing for over the years. And then I added on to that growing seedlings that we sold at our local co-op. Um, we would, you know, capitalize in terms of buying the equipment, you know, say irrigation equipment or um, uh, field field preparation equipment, that type of thing. Um, but I, I would say that that was one of the, as I look back on it, that was one thing that I might have done differently is try to find a way to capitalize what we, you know, sooner. So because instead of limiting yourself by kind of limping by with a minimum of equipment or whatever. You would have taken kind of a bigger risk and just, just kind of gone for is that, I, is that what you mean? Like, um, well, I, I, yeah, kind of having a, or, or getting some better business advice. You know, that mm-hmm. was kind of a weak point on on my part. And I think, as I said, you know, through my work here at ASA, I see some new farms starting up, and I think a lot of young farmers now they've done an internship at working farms. They know what's required, um, and they're kind of in a better position to go out and, and um, you know, have a better business plan um, for how they're going to proceed. Right. And I mean, that's one of the things that we talk about a lot on the show, and it's kind of constantly striking to me is, is at working as a farmer and running, you know, I heard this great, great, great quote, like if you're, if you're not growing food with a financial incentive, you're gardening. So, oh, that's uh, interesting. You know, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I think sometimes, I think for a while, I don't know. I think sometimes people get a little bit too caught up in that, that, um, I think for many years, I, people, um, if you don't look at it as a business that people sometimes don't take you as seriously, but you can still be producing a very valuable product and you can still be building community, you know, locally. Um, so it doesn't invalidate what you're doing, <laughs> even if you're not um, working on a big scale or um, have all your, you know, it's a learning process. Right. And yeah. success can look like a lot of different things depending That's on right. what. Yeah. That's um, right. So I want to talk a little bit about something that I think we always fail to cover when, when speaking with um, growers in the Northeast is water. Um, you mentioned yeah. irrigation equipment, but, you know, you what is what is like your water need on a on a five acre farm and and how do you move the water around the property to the areas you need to get it and and kind of what does that what does that look like mm-hmm. well a general rule of thumb for growing crops vegetables um, or row crops is is an inch of water a week is is about what you need to keep things growing properly. Um, it may be more or less than that but um, and you know you've lived up here in the Northeast and you know, you know, you can have wet summers where it never stops raining and then you have problems with the plants can't grow because the soil isn't draining and you have disease problems or you can have dry times. Um, So if you're going to grow vegetables especially, you really need to have some irrigation set up. On my farm, the Tom Hannock uh, Creek ran through the property and I used a small gas power five horsepower gas powered pump that that pulled water out of the creek and I used a combination of drip tape which you know just lies right on the ground next to the roots and slowly drips water into the soil and then some overhead irrigation which is um, different kinds of uh, rain birds or or whatever Um, and generally that's what people use. Um, On a bigger scale, you need a larger pump. Sometimes people use their tractors to pump water and use um, either um, 
aluminum pipe that you can carry around in sections and set up in different areas, or there's also um, uh, kind of plastic lay flat pipe that that can serve as larger um, um, tubes to get water out into the acreage. But it's a big part of farming <laughs> around here. It takes a lot of energy. It takes good planning. And um, you may have to dig a pond. Um, you may have to have a backup for that even. So it's it's a big part of growing vegetables especially. And that's, I mean, that's something, I, I mean, just to to go and, like, stick your hose essentially in the creek that runs through your land, like, that's... That like that's okay to do, right? I mean, or like well, you know the, what? <laughs> there is some. If you were pumping out enough that you made a a larger impact on the actual flow of the stream, like mm-hmm. say you you made a major impact on the flow downstream from your pump, that would I believe I'm I'm kind of talking off the top of my head here, but I think that would require a permit from the DEC. But for the scale that, you know, that we were working on, it wasn't making a, a much of an impact on the stream at all. Um, um, and then the other consideration, especially if, you know, we were certified organic, is you want to know uh, something about the quality of the water that you're irrigating from. So um, you would, you know, if there was some reason to be concerned um, about, um, say there were factories upstream or something, you might be required to do some water sampling. Um, uh, and that's, you know, that's such a broad issue. It's kind of hard to get your your hands around it because you're also dealing with lots of, you know, the fields and lawns and everything else that's in the watershed that goes into streams. Yeah, that's, that's definitely like a, a topic that we need to explore in another show. Mm-hmm. Um, so... I was curious, you know, you mentioned that your farm was certifi- certified organic. You know, what did that look like in, in, you, you know, in the early 1980s ver- versus, you know, today? I, I know there's been a lot of talk around the organic certification process, and you mentioned NOFA New York, and mm-hmm. I was kind of wondering a little bit about kind of how that movement has evolved over the last, you know, 30 years. Mm-hmm. Well, I... I- I don't actually know when the first year that they um, started doing, that NOFA New York started doing certification. Our farm started in 1988, and I believe the first year we were certified was 90 or 91. Um, and at that point, it was that again was a grassroots, um, you know, organizing to um, have the certification program that consumers that would guide farmers and give consumers something to, you know, look to. Um, And then basically the federal standards, when they came into play, um, you know, changed a little bit the standards that each local organization had um, and also gave more choices on certifying bodies. Um, and it's probably more paperwork, <laughs> and and they've you know they kind of evolve. Like for instance, I've I've still been applying for certification for my greenhouse. I have a small greenhouse um, business that I still do, um, and they're really trying to get people to use as much organic seed as possible. You know, to try to bump that up every year. You can't always find every variety you want in organic, but they really are trying to get us to switch to all the organically grown varieties. Yeah, that was something we talked a little bit about with uh, Seth Jacobs, who we had on the show a few weeks mm-hmm. ago. And I think you do. You have done some some seedlings for him in the past, correct? Yes, I um, start their early tomatoes, which go into their greenhouse in around the first of May. So actually, I'll probably be seeding those this coming weekend in my greenhouse, <laughs> surrounded by snow still. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so we have, we have just a couple of minutes left. I wonder if you have any kind of words of wisdom for for young farmers out there who might be listening, as far as kind of big surprises or or themes or things that you know you you ran into that were a little unexpected and have like the the luxury of looking back on and going, you know, if I'd known this. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I think, you know, I'm so inspired when I go to conferences and I see a lot of young people um, getting involved. And um, I, I think I would just advise people to go to find a good farm to, to be an intern on. There's, um, there's farms that work together and provide a really valuable experience because then you'll know if you really want that kind of life and love that. I think you have to love it. That's my opinion. You have to love farming because there's easier ways of earning a living. Um, and then um, get the experience and then get a viable um, business plan, and, and it's a great life. I think it's, um, I'd encourage anybody who's interested to check it out. Awesome. Janet, thank you so much. It was lovely speaking with you today, and I, I hope to see you soon. Great. Thank you, Erin. It was a pleasure. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to this program on the Heritage Radio Network. You can find all of our archived programs on heritageradionetwork.com, as well as a schedule of upcoming live shows. You can also podcast all of our programs on iTunes by searching Heritage Radio Network in the iTunes Store. You can find us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter for up-to-date news and information. Thanks for listening. following is a public service announcement from Heritage Radio Network. The Snacky Tunes compilation has arrived and is available for free on our website, heritageradionetwork.com. This compilation features live performances from some of the hottest acts around today, including Midnight Magic, Surfer Blood, Overhoffer, and more. Again, you can download this compilation for free on our website, heritageradionetwork.com, and make sure to listen to Snacky Tunes every Monday at 2 p.m. on Heritage Radio Network. The following is a public ser- the following is a public service announcement from Heritage Foods USA. In late March, Dan, Andrea, Patrick, and the Heritage team are traveling to the coldest reaches of the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont to help the Cantor family tap sugar maple trees. Then the maple sap will flow down to the sugar house where it is boiled gently over a wood fire just as it has been for generations. Just a few days later, this grade A amber syrup will be poured into the beautiful glass jugs and sent to you for pancakes, waffles, desserts, glazing hams, or just drinking by the spoonful. There's only a limited supply, so order today. Each one-liter bottle is $45, including delivery. Delivery will be at the end of March, and we will notify you of the exact shipping date. Each shipment will include a CD explaining the whole process. You can also follow us on YouTube while we work and bottle. In the meantime, you can head over to the Heritage Radio Network archives and listen to Linda Palaccio talk about maple syrup on her show, A Taste of the Past, Episode 12. For more information, visit www.heritagefoodsusa.com. The following is a public service announcement from Heritage Radio Network. Join wine impresarios Aaron Fitzpatrick and Brian DeMarco as they dish out on the latest industry news with winemakers and tastemakers on Heritage Radio Network's revamped wine show, Unfiltered. Aaron Fitzpatrick, one of the first hosts on HRN with her program at the root of it, amps up the volume and unfiltered content with co-host Brian DeMarco in this 2011 Redux. True to the original format, Aaron and Brian will keep you abreast of current happenings and break down the news and global events, distilling complex into anecdotal stories that inspire. From media and political events to hailstorms in Argentina, no topic is out of bounds. Tune in every week to hear them chat up the industry's biggest personalities and host on-air tastings with visiting vintners and the country's hottest sommeliers. Whether you're an expert or an enthusiast, Unfiltered demystifies wine and lets you know what it really takes to get a bottle from the vineyard to your neighborhood wine shop. Unfiltered broadcasts live every Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Heritage Radio Network.